So we're starting in with curvature and normal vectors of a curve. That's 13.4. So we're going to look at curvature first. So to get curvature, we need unit speed. So the reason we need unit speed, if you think about curvature, it's basically how tight a turn is. So if we think about, I'll just draw a curve. Racing is fun, so we'll just think about going around this race course right here. When we measure curvature, it shouldn't matter. It shouldn't be dependent on how fast we drive a motorcycle around the racetrack. So it should be independent of our actual speed. So curvature is a property of the curve, not a property of how fast you're moving around the curve. So that's the reason what we need to use unit speed. So our curve <coughs> will have write it as t of t equals r of s inverse of t. So here we have the reparameterization of unit speed right here. And our s of t function, now we're using s inverse of t above, but s of t goes from t0 to t, and this is the magnitude of, we're using a dummy variable, so it's the magnitude of the velocity times d tau. So we're going to use some notation from the book. So another way to compute big T of T, the original curve divided by your speed. R of t divided by magnitude of r dot t. So k is going to be curvature. It's actually a kappa. And our formulas for it d big T over ds. Or dt d little t times d little t over ds. That's just the chain rule right there. <clears throat> we can rewrite this. That magnitude divided by the reciprocal ds over dt. So I just reciprocated the product and wrote it as a fraction. So I'll write this as 1 over the, over the reciprocal of the numerator. And we can write that as 1 over magnitude v times d big T over dt. Which 
which we could again write as ddt of t over magnitude v. All right, so it's a lot of equivalent ways to write this. What way should you use? We'll put this in a box. So we'll go with curvature is one over magnitude of velocity times dt, d big T over dt magnitude where t of t equals v over magnitude v. And of course, v is r dot t. All right, so that's a whole lot of notation. Let's compute a curvature of a curve. So we'll take an easy example. A cos t, A sine t, zero. What will the graph of this curve look like? Should look pretty familiar. Should be a circle. Where is it centered? Zero, zero, zero. So it's a three-dimensional curve, but the z-coordinate is always zero. So if you think about drawing it on your table or your paper, just think your height zero. So it's going to be on the x-y plane, and it's going to go in the normal way, starting in the positive x-axis and doing the regular uh, trigonometry rotation counterclockwise. All right, so we can graph it out super easy. We'll orient the curve like this. A, A minus A minus A. So it should be pretty clear the curvature should be constant. We're always going around the same amount of curve or the same bendiness of the road. It's not a spiral, it's not getting smaller or bigger. All right, so go ahead and make all these computations. <clears throat> uh, when in doubt, take a derivative. So sometimes it's overwhelming. There's a lot of derivatives and magnitudes and uh, divisions we have to do. So just start by finding, we have r, find r dot, then r dot magnitude, and then proceed from there. So when in doubt, start with the derivative. In this case, magnitude will, will go next.
So any computation questions on what's on the board here? I did my T prime computation kind of right in the middle of all that stuff right there. So first thing notice there's <clears throat> there is an A, but there's no T in here. So what that means is the curvature does not depend on time. So no matter where we are, the curvature is this number one over A. So let's look at the circle a little bit more carefully. I'll just draw a circle out without any x, y axis. And the radius was A of the circle. So this is the circle track we're driving around, radius A. Now, <clears throat> the actual curvature is the reciprocal of the radius. So if you think about your radius, our radius is A. So if we're going to drive around a circle track and the radius is huge. So let's say your track is maybe a mile radius. As you're driving, you're barely going to notice that you're turning if your turn is that wide. So it makes sense that you're going to have, if your radius is big, your curvature is really small. And if you're going around a really tight track, like for example, if you're trying to drive around uh, maybe, uh, what's a small circle? Can't think of anything circular. A cul-de-sac, <laughs> and you're trying to drive quickly. So your radius is maybe like 20 feet or 15 feet. You cannot drive very fast because your curvature is so high. So very different driving around, just looping around a cul-de-sac or a roundabout versus going around a mile wide uh, circle. So curvature is the reciprocal of your radius. Uh, because we basically took two derivatives along the way. There was, that's, that's why I kind of highlighted this T prime computation I had to take over here. So I had T is right above here. So that line is T of T, but in the kappa computation, I need a T prime. So I'd take another derivative of T. So let's <coughs> draw a curve that's not going to have constant curvature. And look and see what happens uh, along the way. So I'm trying to draw a curve that gets straighter as it goes. So it's almost turning into uh, a straight line at the end. So there's a couple different components here. I'm going to draw everything in one color. I know that different things have different colors, but I don't want to spend too much time switching colors here. So we're going to assume unit velocity. I'll call that V0 and V1 for velocity at time 0 and velocity at time 1. So I'm going to zoom in even further here. So we're orienting this curve to the right. So we're going to the right as time increases. And the way I like to think about your velocity is if you were driving, riding on ice skates and then you all of a sudden fell, what would happen? You would just kind of keep going straight until you hit the wall of the ice skating rink. So that's, that's how I like to think about velocity as you're going around a turn. So your velocity will be basically the path you would take if you fell on your ice skates and you keep going uh, with no friction. <clears throat> your future velocity is going to be something like this right here before you eventually get up to the velocity V1. What's the difference between these two velocities right here? So let's look at that. I'll call this, actually, I'll call this guy V2 and that'll be V1 right there. So I'm going to draw V0 and V1 starting from the same point. So there's V2 and v, uh, V0 and V1. They're similar, but there's a difference between the two. So what's the difference? If I subtract them, I will get that vector right there. If I add the green vector to V0, I get V1. This vector, this tells you how velocity changes. What do we call the change in velocity? Acceleration. So what I just drew is the acceleration vector right there. We'll call that A0. 
So I'll bring that up here. That'll be A0, acceleration. Actually, I don't want to call this A0. This can be misleading. I'm going to call it N. The reason is, <clears throat> it is the acceleration, but it's the it's the acceleration if you're not changing speed. So what that means is our two velocities are both magnitude one, so it's how your velocity direction's changing. Uh, so it's called the normal vector. If I allowed my velocity to be whatever the natural velocity was without enforcing it to be one all the time, it would be the acceleration. So it's almost the acceleration except we're keeping our velocity constant, so it tells you how the direction of your velocity changes, not the magnitude. And that's why it's n and not just regular acceleration. So it's really similar. All right, the, this n is t dot, so it's how t changes or dt over d little t. Now because our velocities, we talked about this and computed it last maybe two sections ago, if your velocity is constant, your derivative has to be perpendicular to your velocity. So if your, or if your speed is constant, your derivative has to be perpendicular. We drew that unit circle and looked at two velocities in it, and the difference is always going to be perpendicular. So let's write that down. So when t equals v over magnitude v, which is r dot over r dot magnitude, it is a unit vector. So we force it to be a unit vector by divided by its magnitude for all time t. So this vector n, which we call dt over B, dt, is orthogonal to t and represents how t changes. Now, if your particle is going completely straight, meaning your velocity is going to be constant for a couple of uh, units of time, then your n can actually be zero. If you're going in an actual straight line, your velocity won't be changing, so your n can be zero. Uh, n's always going to point to the center of the curve that you're on. And this uh, curve, which is uh, approximated by a circle, so the radius of the circle is the reciprocal of the curvature, as we saw before. So radius is one over kappa. Where kappa is one over magnitude v times magnitude dt dt. So in summary, n is or we'll start with t. t is the normalized 
velocity. And n is the normalized derivative of the normalized derivative. Where is the normalized derivative of the normalized velocity? So the formula for n will be t dot over magnitude t dot. <clears throat> Which of course is dt over dt divided by magnitude dt dt. And of course t is r dot over magnitude r dot. So that's probably what you need there. And then I've got kappa written down right above here. So this is probably your best places, your best uh, options for your cheat sheet right here. I think I circled another kappa up top that should be exactly, yeah, the same thing we wrote down again. So I'm kind of writing down the same things a couple times. They only need to be on our cheat sheet once. All right, so let's go and label a few more. Uh, now, because these aren't really velocities, I'm gonna call them T instead of V. So these Vs really should be Ts. T0, T1, T2, T1. And I better call the A0, really should be N0. That's N0. All right, N1. <clears throat> Here's T1. So draw where you think N1 should be right here. So from this point, draw what direction you think N1 should go. It's how your <clears throat> direction is going to be modified as you move further down the curve to the right. So I just drew another tangent right here, and it looks like Rn. Well, first of all, n should always be perpendicular to t. So right away, it has to exist in this line right here. It has to exist somewhere along that line, and it's going to go a little bit upwards, not downwards, because just because the direction the curve is going. It's always pointing towards the center of the curve. So your n1 is going to look like that. Now it's gonna be normalized, so it should have length one. T should have length one, I'm not really drawing them to scale. So it should be normalized to length one if I pay attention to that. Looks like N zero should be right about that big and N one should be about that big right there. And when we go all the way over here to T two, we'll draw a normal over there as well. So this is going to exist perpendicular and this curve is going to the left, so it's going to go kind of up to the left. So our N2 will look like that. So what this gives us is what we're gonna see very soon called a local frame. It's basically a local set of coordinates that are going to, one of them is direction of travel or along your velocity, and then the other one is gonna be perpendicular to how your velocity is gonna change. If I wanna get a third vector that's perpendicular to these two, how would I get it? Cross product, right hand rule. So there'll be another vector that we're gonna get when we cross these two vectors and it's gonna go up. So you can go your pointer finger's direction you're moving, your middle finger's direction your acceleration or how your movement direction changes, and then your thumb is a cross product of those two. So your middle finger always points towards the center of the curve you're going to be turning into. Uh, we can go ahead and draw the full circle here. I'll switch over to this 
orange marker. So what I want to do at T0 is draw the actual circle we'd be traversing. So this is kind of tricky because it's not, you can sort of use the word tangent, but I want to approximate this part of the curve with a full circle. So I'm going to try to keep that amount of curvature and draw a full circle. So it's probably going to look something, oh, I think I went too far there. Wow, it's a horrible circle. Maybe something like that right there. So that would be the circle that we're trying to go around. That still doesn't feel very accurate, but. Maybe another way to think about it, if you think about driving, motorcycle or car, doesn't matter, the amount your front wheel is turned would create, if you kept driving exactly like that, you would be going around a full circle. Of course, at some point you'll go off the road, but theoretically, if you're on a completely flat surface and the, the track was just painted, you would go around a full circle at that exact turning radius right there. So that's another way to think about the circle that would be completed if you kept taking that same curvature. So let's go ahead and draw this actual full circle out. Then we'll do an example where we're gonna compute curvature along a curve and then compute the actual circle that would uh, be formed from this curve. So here's our curve. Let's take the point right there. So I'm only gonna worry about one point, so we're just gonna have, I don't need to have different T vectors, we'll just have single T, single N, go in that direction. Now I'm gonna draw a circle here, and I'll switch to green for my circle. Do my best to do a full circle, <clears throat> trying to match curvature here. So the circle, of course, is gonna have a center. The N is pointing directly to the center of the circle. We'll use C for the center. So how does a radius relate to computations that we can make? So how does radius relate to the kappa or the curvature? Yeah, it's just one over the kappa, one over curvature. That kappa was computed with a magnitude, so it's gonna always be positive. So you're never gonna get zero for your curvature or never get negative for your curvature. All right, so that's radius center. Let's write down the formula for the center. All right, we have a point right here. This curve is R of T. And let's say T naught is the point in time that we're gonna be right there. So we'll just use T naught for that time value. So if we know T naught, <clears throat> so I'll write K naught for the kappa at T naught. We'll do T zero for our and N zero, so that's the actual uh, normalized velocity and the normal vector N. So I can write out this center. It's going to be R of T zero plus N of T zero I'll just call that N zero. Now, how far in the N direction should I go? I wanna go R in that direction. Now, good news is N's already a unit vector. So if I need to go four in that direction, it's just four N zero because we already normalized N zero. So it's just, and R is one over K and one over kappa. 
So that's our center right there. So we'll do our example now. So let y equal x cubed. Find circle approximating curve at x equals 1. So I'm going to graph this out. It's a cubic function, so it's going to look just about like this right here. There is one t value or one point on this curve that would have a bad circle. So let's think about driving along this curve. There's exactly one point that has no curvature. The origin, you're basically going from turning right to turning left. And so at one point, you'll actually have, you'll be on a curve that's infinitely Let's write, has infinite curvature, or no, has an infinite radius, so zero curvature, or has no curvature. So that would be a bad point to ask about curvature because your circle would be infinitely large. So what we're doing instead is taking an x value of one, so we will get some curvature right there. We can roughly sketch out what our circle is going to look like, maybe something sort of like that right there. Why did I, <clears throat> what is the difference between how I wrote the problem down and all the computations we made above? There's a huge difference. So above, we started with a function of t. Did we start with parameterized example? Sure didn't, so step one, we better turn it into a parameterized example. So what we need to do is create an R of T function. So let's do that first. So we need to create a parameterized version. You could convert everything to rectangular computations, but we already went through everything in parameterized uh, vector form, so we're gonna just turn our example into vector form. So I need an R of T, which of course has an X component and a Y component. So if I look at my equation, if I knew what X was, what would Y be? A cube of that. So what's something easy I could pick for X? Let's pick the easiest thing, zero. On my graph, is every x coordinate zero? Nope, so that's not gonna work. So I can't pick a single number. Let's just go with t for x. So I'll just pick t for x, and then y is gonna be cube of what I chose for x right there. You can pick almost anything for x that allows it to go from negative to positive. So I could have picked 6t if I wanted to and then, and then cube the 6t for my y. I just picked the easiest thing I could for x that would move from left to right. All right, so again, I made that choice. So I basically just chose the easiest x, x function I could think of which is t. All right, you should be able to compute everything from this. So when in doubt, take a derivative, then take the magnitude of that derivative, and then keep going after that. The point on the curve is 1, 1 in Cartesian coordinates. So if you could find the center of the circle, you have a point on the circle, you should, be get, you should be able to get the entire equation of a circle from that. So 
I'm worried if I leave all this on the board, you won't be able to read anything. But that's all the information you need. So what I'm going to do is leave the upper part on the board. So these are all the computations you need to make. So I'll give you two minutes. You're always getting T first and N second. You got to know what your T tangent, uh, unit tangent derivative is, and then you can find the normal of that. All right, so this should be your t of t function here. Is that what you got? <clears throat> so I'm going to plug in our t naught right now, which I'll just call, I already called that t0. So I'm plugging in, now I'm plugging in 1, even though I think I already labeled it as, nope. Let's call it t1, because we're actually plugging in 1 for t. So it's 1 over square root 1 plus 9, 1 comma 3. All right, so this should be T1 right here. There is one property I can easily check with T, uh, T1. What should the magnitude of this vector be? supposed to be the unit tangent velocity. So it better have magnitude 1 if I check it. So if I square them both, they're both going to be tenths. It's going to be 1 tenth plus 9 tenths is going to be 10 tenths if I square them, add them together. 
All right, doesn't mean that it's correct, but at least means that the magnitude is one. So we did something correct at least. All right, so this should be T1 right there. So that is part of what I need. Now we need to get the N, the perpendicular. So N going back up is going to be derivative of T divided by the magnitude of the derivative. So this is where it's going to start to be annoying. What happens when I compute T dot? What happens if I use what I have circled right here? If I take the derivative of 1 over square root 10 comma 3 over square root 10, what would I get? Zero. So it's the same problem in Calc 1. If you plug in your input before your derivative, you'll get a zero derivative. So make sure when you're computing T dot, we're actually using the one above. All right, this one above, the way it's written, there is a scalar function times a vector function. So we have a scalar function. And let's write this as 1 plus 9t to the fourth to the negative one half. So I'm just rewriting the reciprocal square root as a negative half power. So that's our alpha of t function right there. So that's alpha of t. And then the second part right here is v of t. So I'm just writing it as alpha of t times v of t. What rule do I need on this derivative? So I need product rule on this. It'll turn out to be very chain-like, but the way it's written, there's a product between these two. So it's going to look like a prime v plus, or alpha prime v plus alpha v prime. So this is how the product rule works. So let's go ahead and compute it like this. So if I write it in here, it's gonna be one plus nine t to the fourth to the negative half power derivative times regular v function plus regular alpha function times the derivative I'll make my primes in green so it's super obvious where my derivatives are right there. So any questions on what I'm doing here? The other option is you can also distribute your alpha function into here. Just use scalar multiplication and then you'll have kind of an internal chain rule going on, or an internal quotient rule going on. Uh, I'm doing things separately, so we're doing two separate computations. All right, so this first <coughs> derivative is going to be a bit of a nightmare. We are going to have negative 1 half times 1 plus 9t to the fourth to the negative 3 halves power times 36t cubed. So one half times 36 is negative 18 divided by, so it'd be the square root cubed 
of 1 plus 9t to the fourth. times 1 plus 3t squared. So that's just the first part of the derivative right there. Oh, yes, absolutely. t cubed. All right, second part of the derivative is going to be much easier. We're just taking the derivative of 3, well, just the vector part. We have 0, 9t squared. Um, isn't it supposed to be 3t squared, not 3t cubed? Oh, 3t, yes. Squared, so that would be. 6t All right, so that is t dot. All right, do you want to take the magnitude of this in this current form? No. In fact, you actually can't take the magnitude in the current form. You have to turn it into a single vector, so you have to add the two together. So that's making my brain hurt thinking about it. Let's look a little bit ahead. What are we using this for? So it's already a miserable enough derivative. This is basically our last step pretty much in calculus is compute this right here. So we currently have t dot. We computed t dot. What I need to do is compute the magnitude of t dot next. Let's go ahead and plug in the t value because we're done taking derivatives. So we're going to plug in the actual t value, get the proper, um, so we don't need to know every single normal vector. We just need to know the normal vector at time one. So we want to know n1, so this will be t1 dot over t1 dot magnitude. Well, if we write it out, it's t dot of 1 divided by t dot of 1 magnitude. So we're going to plug in 1 and then take the magnitude. All right, so we plug in 1. It's still going to be a little ugly. square root 10 cubed Problem looks so simple when I was writing it down. Oy. All right, eighteen times three is fifty four, maybe Ten cubed plus zero six over square root ten. Oh.
That's not so bad. So we have a little negative x and a little bit positive y. So we'll go way back here, a little negative x and some positive y. So it looks like it's at least believable our normal goes the right direction, a little negative x and positive y. When, when you took out the one over root 10, wouldn't it be a part of just a 6, not a 6 over 10? So I did, I did a few things. I factored the square root out. Yeah, does that work? Maybe I should do something a little easier than that. So if I want to be negative 3, 1, That'd be six. Is that right? That seems right. I think that's right. Yeah, so go left three, up one. <clears throat> so that's something like left three, up one, more or less like that. All right. So we have the normal, that's n, or n1 right there. All right, how do we get curvature? So we have kappa equals one over magnitude v times t dot magnitude. All right, we probably computed all these things somewhere along the way. Oh, wait. All that stuff we computed was just t dot. That was not n. That was t dot of 1. So n is t dot, uh, well n1 is t dot of 1 divided by t dot of 1 magnitude. Ah, that did not look like it had magnitude 1 right there. That was what I was worried about. All right, let's find the magnitude of this right here. So the reason that, <clears throat> one of the reasons I simplified this down, well it was really ugly to look at before, but also to find the magnitude, I can bring my scalars outside my magnitude computation. So I'm taking the magnitude of what's above, so it's 6 over 10 square root 10. That scalar you just bring outside the magnitude, and we have square root 3 squared plus 1 squared, which is square root 10, which will cancel the other square root 10, so we have 6 over 10, which is 3 fifths. So we have t dot of 1, which is 1 over square root 10 times 6 tenths is, five, is 3 fifths times negative 3 1 divided by 3 fifths so three-fifths cancels. So we have one over square root 10 ne uh, times negative three, the vector negative three, one. So that's n1. And if we would take the magnitude, we would get three squared plus one squared is square root 10 divided by square root 10. So this is magnitude one. 
So that is N1 right there. So I unfortunately can't get all this on the board. So our kappa is one over our normalized velocity. So that is magnitude of V up there. We plug in a one, we get square root 10. So that's our normalized, or our velocity. Times the magnitude of T dot, which was somewhere around here, three fifths. So that's kappa, the radius is the reciprocal, 5 thirds times square root 10. Okay, so we got the radius of our circle. Do we have the center? Nope, but if we go back to our picture, we finally have the normal, we have the point, the normal, we just figured out the radius, I, I wrote it down but I forgot what it was, it was 5 thirds square root 10. So all you have to do is go 5 thirds square root 10 distance in the n direction from 1 1. So let's figure out the center from that information. So center equals start at 1, 1 plus you're going n times, nope, not kappa, n times 1 over kappa. And that 1, 1, let's call it, that would just be r of 1. So we have 1, 1 plus n, which somewhere down there, 1 over square root 10, negative 3, 1, times 1 over kappa, which was 5 thirds square root 10. So square root, square root cancels. 5 thirds, negative 3, 1. All right, so our center is negative four comma eight thirds. So that is our center right there. C, negative four, eight thirds. Now, if we just knew the equation of a circle. So a circle is x minus the uh, center coordinate squared plus y minus the other center coordinate squared equals r squared. And all you have to do is plug in all those values that we just computed. So it did take forever to get x naught, y naught, the center of that circle, but we had the radius a little while ago. When I made that problem up, it seemed like it would be way easier than that, but I guess not. All right, so let's do a, oh, let's get out of here. <laughs>